You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Hey, Foundry family. It's truly an honor to be with you again today, to be able to open our texts together. We're going to look at a passage, a, a parable, a story that Jesus tells. And he wants to teach us something through that story. And I think you're going to be amazed. You're going to be blown away by what Jesus does and how Jesus tells the story. But before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you have gathered us together. We thank you that we can come and we can be in fellowship, we can worship, and we can open your scripture and you can teach us. Lord, you tell us that your word is alive and active. And so we expect that it is going to change us. So Holy Spirit, take these words from the page and put them into our hearts. Give us eyes to see what you want us to see, ears to hear what you want us to hear. And then give us feet for the path that you are going to call us to walk as you send us out of this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, we get to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. But we also get to walk in the footsteps of Luke because we've been following Luke's book, his gospel. Luke is one of four writers that give us the story of Jesus, a biography of Jesus. And we have to remember that Luke speaks from a specific perspective. Luke has a message for his audience, and so he includes certain things in his gospel that the other writers don't include. So we have to remember, who was Luke's audience? Who was he writing to? Well, we know that Luke was a a travel partner with Paul. And as Paul worked his way through Asia Minor, He spoke the good news to the Gentiles. Those living in a Greek world, in a a Roman world. And they had a a Western world view. That's the way they looked at the world. And so Luke has this challenge of taking the good news, the gospel, and making it applicable to the Gentiles and helping them understand the culture and the context of the stories in the book. And we have to remember that. We also have to remember that Luke was speaking specifically to a person named Theophilus, possibly the the man who allowed Luke to write his book or his biography. Maybe Theophilus said, I want you to write about Jesus. We don't know much about Theophilus, but we do know that he could have been quite wealthy. So that's Luke's audience. That's the context that he puts these stories of Jesus in. Today we get to look at parables. Now these are stories that Jesus told in order to teach his audience something. And they're delightful. But we have to remember that these stories weren't necessarily new stories. These characters weren't necessarily new characters. This, these were the, the stories that the people told to each other and they, they passed along. You see, we have this in our tradition too. If I were to say a rabbi, a pastor, and a priest walked into a bar, you would kind of know where I was going with that story. All these characters have stereotypes, and it's the same thing in that culture. These were the the stories of the peasants that they would tell one another. But Jesus does a delightful thing because he takes these stories and he twists them to the delight of his listeners. Last week in your devotionals, you read a story about a son who took his inheritance, who who took everything that 
he had, and he left his family, he left his father, and he went to a distant country, and he squandered it all, and he came back. Now, you see, in that culture, if you did that with the family's inheritance, you would no longer be allowed to come back. And so as the listeners of this story were hearing this, I think they were thinking, oh, he's going to get what's coming to him when he comes back. But then Jesus takes the ending of that parable. And instead of having a father who cuts his son off, the father welcomes his son back into his arms and even throws a party. And so in these parables, they're not just stories, but they help us see a little bit about who God is and what the kingdom of heaven is like. There were also a, a couple stories that you looked at last week in your devotionals. One, one was a woman who lost a coin and she searched and she searched for this one coin. And when she found it, she invited everyone to come and celebrate. And then there was this story of the shepherd. And the shepherd lost the sheep. And he went and looked diligently for the lost sheep. And when he found it, he celebrated. And so we get a glimpse of who God is in these, in these stories. God is the shepherd who, who will look for his lost sheep. That one who's lost. And he'll do anything he can to rescue that sheep. He's like the woman who finds the coin. He will do anything he can. He'll celebrate when he finds what was lost. And so we see a little bit about who God is. But Jesus does something amazing. He uses a technique in his parables. We call it from lesser to greater. Or you could say, how much more? So Jesus tells the story of the shepherd who goes looking for one sheep. And if a shepherd can do that for a sheep, how much more will God do that for you? Now it's also interesting that when we read these parables, Jesus is keenly aware of who's in his audience. And he usually has a message for everyone. And it's not always an easy message to hear. You see the, the parable of the prodigal son, where the son comes home and his father celebrates. Jesus adds a character into this parable because we learn that it's not just his disciples that are listening to this story. But it's the Pharisees. It's the ones who God put in charge of his people. God gave them the resources and said, take care of my people. So Jesus puts another character in that story, and it's the character of the oldest son. The one who was supposed to take care of the family. The one who was supposed to throw the party when the son came back. But he refuses to. And so I wonder if those who are listening, the Pharisees, felt that. Jesus put these zingers into this story to teach a lesson. And it's amazing what he does with our parable today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 16. The parable is in chapter 16. It starts with, Verse 1, and I'm going to read it, and then we're going to go back through, and we're going to look at some of the elements of this parable. It says this, he also said to his disciples, so we, we learn that he is speaking to his disciples. There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. 
So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to you, another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. What? Have you heard that parable before? It can be quite confusing because at first glance, when we read that parable, we think, did the master just commend Did the rich man just commend his, the master for being dishonest? Is he encouraging us to be shrewd? Is he encouraging us to, to take someone else's resources and use them for our gain? What? But I wonder if we're looking at this story through Western Greek Roman eyes, I think there's something more to this story. Because we have to remember these stories come from an Eastern culture. So what was the audience of Jesus hearing in this parable? Well, let me introduce you to the characters, the actors of the parable. We start with the master. He's the landowner. He's quite wealthy. Our Bibles say he's rich. But what's interesting is in the parable, we also see that, you know what? There's nothing in the parable that says he's dishonest. In fact, there's people who are looking out for him. People come to him and say, your manager is being dishonest. They They come to him. He's a pillar in this community. And so he has land, lots of it. I'm sure he has wheat fields. He has vineyards. He has olive orchards filled with olive trees. And then you have these guys, the debtors, the tenants. And we know that these guys are probably pretty wealthy because of the amount of goods that they're dealing with in this parable. Now what would happen, the practice in in that culture would be that the master would rent out some of his land to the debtors, to the tenants. They would farm the land. And we know that one of the tenants in our family, one of the debtors, or in our story, is, is an olive harvester. He grows olives from olive trees. And the other one is a wheat farmer. And so they'll rent the land, and how this works is they decide on an amount, a percentage of the product at harvest will go back to the master. So they owe the master goods, but they don't owe him that until harvest time. And you can imagine the relationship has to be pretty good between these two. If there's dishonesty on either part, then this relationship doesn't work. If the master expects that the debtors are taking advantage of him, he won't rent to them land. And the debtors want to make sure that the master isn't being dishonest with him. But then there's this guy. It's the middle man. The one who goes between the master and the debtors. Now, in that culture, the master would pay the manager to, be, to manage his estate. He would be like an estate manager. And he would be the ones who would deal with the debtors. But he would have the authority of the master. And the master would trust him to be obedient to him because he needed to trust him. Because what the manager did reflected who the master was was. Okay? So let's enter back into the story. There was a rich man who had a manager. 
and charges were brought to him, charges were brought to the master that this man was wasting his possessions. So the master learned from someone else that this manager was being dishonest and was not representing the master well. And this was bad for the master because the master had a reputation to uphold in in the village. And he called him, the master called him and said to his manager, what is this I hear about you? He asks him, what have you been doing? What's fascinating, and I think what the audience would have heard was the silence after that question. What have you been doing? Mm. The manager knows. He knows he's been dishonest. He has no excuse. And the master says this, turn in the account of your management for you can no longer be my manager. As of this point, you no longer have a job. I need you to go and turn in your books. What would you do? At this point, I may be like, well, you know what? My, my, family's, been, um, my family's been sick and, and we need some extra cash. And, and you know Joe over here, he made me do it. And... and but there's no excuse. There's silence. The manager doesn't even try to defend himself. And I think it's because he knows that the master is right. He knows he has no excuse. He knows he's been caught. But the manager also realizes something about the master. Number one, he demands obedience. Because dishonesty reflects on the master. And number two, in this culture, if you did this, you know where you go first? You go to jail. So I think the manager realizes the great mercy of the master. And the grace that the master has just shown to this manager. Yes, the master can't continue to have this happen, but we don't read about the manager going to jail. And then this. Because time is ticking. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? So I can imagine the the manager is on his way to go get the books, right? As of this point, he's been let go. He's been fired. But he's on his way to go get the books and he starts to think, okay, I'm in trouble here. Because people are going to start to hear what has happened and my reputation is going to be ruined. And so he says this, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. So you can see the wheels are turning in his head. This is a public image thing for him. How am I going to get a job if they hear that I was dishonest? Our story doesn't tell us what he ends up coming up with. We see it later, but this is what it says. Okay, I have decided what to do. So in his head, he says, I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So we don't get an insight as to what's going on, but we see the result of what he decided to do, right? The next thing he does is he summons the debtors or he summons one of the debtors at a time. Why did he only summon one of the debtors at a time? Because time is of the essence. The minute they start to realize that he got fired, this, is, this plan is no longer going to work. And can you imagine the two debtors sitting there going, wait a second, what's going on? Like this is. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, 
He said to the first. He doesn't even say welcome. He doesn't even say sir. He doesn't, you can see that he's doing this rather quickly. But he's still using his authority because you don't summon someone unless you have authority. So I imagine he sent his servant maybe over to the dares and said, come, I have a deal for you. And I wonder if it went kind of like this. I talked to the master. I twisted his arm. And let me tell you what we came up with. He says, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. He cut it in half. Can you imagine what the debtor was thinking? It's not time to pay up. It's not harvest yet. I wonder if he's thinking, oh, man. This is surprising. But what a nice guy. And this master... Man, generous. And he says to the second one, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write 80. And that's it. That's the story. So how did this play out? I wonder if the manager came back to the master with his books. And I wonder if the town, the village had already been talking. I wonder if they had already been saying things like, oh, that master, you know, the one who owns all that land, did you hear? Did you hear how generous he is? Did you see what he did for his debtors? You see, the manager put it all on the line. It was either this plan or it was jail. The manager put all his bets on the generosity of the master. So imagine the manager walking back in to meet the master, the landowner. And the landowner is put between a rock and a hard place, right? What do I do? Do I go back and tell the debtors that, the ma- that I had already fired the manager? I don't. Or... Do I take the praise of the people? And do I come out of this looking good? And I think that's what happened. Because we hear this next line. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. And the Easterners who were listening, the peasants who were listening to this, they cheered. That's a great story. This is a David and Goliath story. The manager won. But there's something here that you need to see. The master commended the dishonored manager for his shrewdness. Another word for shrewdness is wisdom. And in that culture, they understood wisdom as self-preservation. So the master commended the dishonest manager for his self-preservation. So what actually happened in this parable? Here you have a generous master who is merciful beyond all ends. And you have the manager who was dishonest, who got caught, who had no excuse for what he did. And the master requires obedience. And so this manager is in a helpless situation. But he puts his hope.
And he puts in tr- his trust in the generosity of the master. And the master covers the cost to save the manager. Friends, we serve a a God who is so generous. And there will be a time when we come up wanting, when we're dishonest, and we're going to be held accountable, and there's nothing we're going to be able to say. There's no excuses. So what do we do? We're in a helpless situation. Friends, there's one option, and that's to put our trust in the generosity and the mercy of the master. And let me tell you, friends, he is generous. He will pay the price to save you. That's what he was commended for, not his dishonesty. And I love what Jesus does next, right? He kind of tells us, he wants to make sure we get it. He says this, for the sons of this world, this manager, are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light, than the righteous. This man wasn't righteous. He was dishonest and the manager still saved him. How much more will God give to the righteous, to you and me. When you look at this in the cultural context, you see a Middle Easterner will look at this, an Easterner will say, man, yes, the hero is the dishonest person. We struggle with that. But the Middle Easterner will say, well, why would you have to criticize him? And it's fascinating because Luke will include something else in this account. Luke wants to make sure that we also get the point. Why do you think that? Well, do you remember who Luke's audience was? It was a bunch of Gentiles, and I'm sure they had the same reaction we had. So listen to what Luke says. He continues on and tells us that this is, these are the words of Jesus. He says this, And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. This passage isn't about his dishonesty. He didn't get commended for his dishonesty. He got commended for what he put his trust in. If then that you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I don't, I don't commend the dishonesty. What I commend is what you put your trust in. Now, what's interesting about this passage is there were other people listening as Jesus told this story. Listen to this. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Friends, what do you put your trust in? God is going to give us resources like the master gave the manager. And he says, take care of each other. Take care of this world. The resources aren't bad. He gives us blessings so that we can bless others. But here's the thing. What do you put your trust in? Do you put your trust in the blessing or the one who blesses? Because friends, those resources can go away. Your money, your health, your relationships. We have a God who says, let me hold on to that, those things, so that you don't have to. You have a saying here at the foundry where you live palms up. That's what this is all about. 
God's going to bless you with things, but those are his things that he asks you to be responsible with and to steward. So what do you put your trust in? The stuff? Like the Pharisees? They needed to be challenged that day. Or God, who is generous beyond all measure. That's what the disciples needed to hear that day. And I think that's what we need to hear today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, show us the things in our life that we put our trust in. Whether it's our 401ks, whether it's our health, whether it's our family, whatever it is, Lord, help us to let go and give it to you and say, Lord, you have given this to me. How can I steward this in a way that honors you? Help us to put our trust in you, the giver of all good gifts. Because you are generous. And we know, Lord, that when we put our trust in you, you pay the price. in order to save us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.